Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bobby Elias, and I'd like to welcome you to our third program of the winter quarter. Our guest today is Mr. Uh, Hank Ketchum, who, uh, as you know, draws the Dennis the Menace cartoon. I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about him before we get into the program. Uh, Mr. Ketchum was born in Seattle, Washington in 1920, and he entered the University of Washington in 1937 as an art major. But after a year, the cartooning urge lured him to Hollywood and, and to the Walt Lance Animation Studios. He later moved to the Walt Disney Studio and worked on Pinocchio, Fantasia, and other Disney productions until Pearl Harbor Day. World War II added to his professional experience as Mr. Ketchum did war bond posters and wrote, directed, and helped produce six motion picture cartoon shorts. Dennis the Menace, inspired by Mr. Ketchum's own son, Dennis, was launched as a daily feature by the Hall Syndicate on March 12, 1951, in 15 newspapers. In its first year of publication, the feature won Mr. Ketchum the award of the National Cartoonist Society as the best cartoonist of the year. Since then, Dennis the Menace has spread throughout the United States and over the world in more than 700 daily and Sunday newspapers. It has been translated into 14 languages, and it appears in 43 foreign countries. Uh, in the release that I received uh, on Mr. Ketchum, there was a funny last line there, uh, which sort of sums up, I think, to me, Dennis the Menace. It's a quote attributed to Mr. Ketchum, and he goes, Contemplating the growth of his brainchild, Mr. Ketchum is sometimes struck by the horrifying thought, what if we had named our son George? Uh, we're going to begin now with a question-answer period. Uh, uh, anything you'd like to know about Dennis the Menace or anything, just raise your hand. Hold the phone a minute, Bob. Okay. He just, he just blew my whole speech. I had it all memorized, and he comes out and reads it. Uh, Thank you for doing all that uh, spade work for me. I appreciate uh, you folks coming in here. Uh, I'm sure that the curiosity must have been quite something. It is what on earth is a cartoonist doing speaking? A cartoonist expresses himself pretty much in drawings and uh, lives in a little cave back in the woods and rarely sees uh, civilization as a hermit. But he gets it out gets out the information in, uh, in drawings, and uh, to have a cartoonist come up here and talk is kind of ridiculous, and uh, that's probably why we got the hall so jammed today. Uh, I also want to thank Angela Davis for taking away a lot of the crowd. <laughs> I understand she's got a little thing going on the campus. Um, when all of you were uh, six years old, by that time you had zeroed in pretty much the things you wanted to do when you grew older. Some of you want to be a fireman, another want to be a jet pilot, somebody wanted to be a, an ecology specialist, or a garbage man, or a TV star, or a nurse. Uh, and I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was six years old. And most everybody starts changing every year, they want to be something else. Uh, they get real fickle and they go through the whole line of about 20 different professions they really want to, to become involved with until they, by the time they enter college, they they're really confused and, and really don't have a clue as to what they want to do, which is kind of sad because uh, you wasted so much time, really. I, I'd never get off the track. I've always wanted to draw funny pictures. And um, I finally got to the University of Washington. It, it was such a big school that I, I was uncomfortable and decided to leave after a year. We had, if you can believe, 12,000 students up there, which is, you know, pretty pretty jammed, and probably put almost as many in this room. Uh, I went down to, uh, to this part, I came down to this part of the world, and as I tell people, I graduated from, from the University of Walt Disney, which I think is almost apt, because when I was uh, helping to clean up uh, Pinocchio, there were, uh, no, it wasn't a dirty picture, it's called, you know, we have rough lines and we make cleanups on it. Uh, there were about 1,200 employees, young boys and girls working out at, uh, on Hyperion Boulevard until we moved to Burbank and 
we had a wonderful esprit de corps out there, and there were some great talents to work with. And it was like a university. We were all learning and, uh, and earning, not much, but we were at least uh, independent and um, terribly excited about what was going on. And at Walt Disney and Walt Lance and, and, and Hanna-Barbera and the other similar organization, one adds a great dimension to their ability to create cartoons. That is the dimension of time, of, of movement, of weight, and uh, these are factors that are most helpful later on. Uh, when my son was about two and a half years old, his mother, in a fit of anger after one of, the, one of his son's episodes, uh, said, your son is a menace. And I thought, hmm, Dennis the menace, uh, say, boy, and the lights went on and I rushed to my drawing board and I said, that's too good a name to throw away. Got all the kid gags I had in my file and sent them to, to New York to a man who was representing me there. And uh, that was in October of 1950. And uh, in March of 51, it was Dennis and Menace was released to uh, 18 newspapers in the United States. And as Bob mentioned, uh, he is now in 750 newspapers daily and Sunday throughout the world. It was quite an amazing rise of popularity. But at that time, uh, as I say, I was uh, collecting all of my kid gags that seemed to relate to the subject matter and just throwing those in, which I wouldn't do now because I know the characters now. Dennis and his parents, the Mitchells, and Mr. and Mrs. Wilson, Joey, Dog Ruff, Margaret, they're all friends of mine now. I know them. I live in their neighborhood. Uh, I've known this five-year-old for 20 years. Uh, incidentally, uh, Dennis's birthday, every birthday is his sixth, then he becomes five again immediately, <laughs> which may be frustrating, but it's not bad because he never has to go to school. He's always in what he calls the kitty garter. Uh, so the, 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 the names and the sizes of the shapes, uh, the ages remain the same throughout. Dennis is always going to be an only kid. And uh, to me, it, it's, it's a nice way to work because we don't run into the problems of growth, of, of education, of prejudice. Uh, we, Dennis is, is too big to put black back in the playpen. He's too little to hit. He's too young to put in jail. Uh, he's, he has more energy than most people and curiosity. He's endowed with kindness and love, respect. He also has a great deal of confidence in himself. And uh, he's truly a good kid, but uh, he also likes a lot of fun. But he's honest, and that honesty is what, of course, very often upsets the apple cart with the adults. Dennis is, when it, now that I've gotten to know him, is the kind of kid that you'd like to have around your house, or at least in the neighbor's house. I don't know <laughs> if I can stand him or not. He's no more menace than any other five-year-old child. It's just a, it was just a good name for him. In the beginning, uh, to give you an example of the, I should check in here, really. I haven't done a thing. Um, oh, I have some, we have some tools here, Bob. Let me draw this. Some charcoal, if you want some charcoal. Oh, all right. Ah, my pockets. Huh? Well, uh, to begin with, uh, drawing that I had of, this is a very bad rendition here. Of two swans gliding along in the lake, and this one with a knot in his neck is saying to the other one, stay away from the kid in the red sweater. <laughs> uh, it's, it makes a funny picture, but I certainly wouldn't touch it now. Uh, Dennis just wouldn't do that. He's, he likes animals, and uh, he's a very kind guy, but it made a very funny picture in the early days. Uh, I'd do things like that. 
Um, for instance, uh, one of the early early gags too was uh, that showed the father. He's standing here with a gun, and Dennis is very happy looking at his dad. And of course, his dad in the foreground. There's a there's a a burglar with his hands up. He was ransacking the family silver. And uh, back in the hallway, Dennis has got his arms wrapped around his daddy's legs. He was he's days in his pajamas, and he's saying, Attaboy, Dad, squirt it right in his eye. <laughs> <laughs> well, much as I dislike guns, uh, it would still be a funny gag today. And it was done many years ago when I didn't, not only did I not really know Dennis's personality, but I didn't know how to draw him properly. He looked terribly out of drawing. Another, now there are a lot of things, of course. I get uh, mail and suggestions from, from people, from grandmothers and mothers, and <coughs> whose darling little children have just done the most amusing things, like flushing the kitty down the toilet and, you know, <laughs> fun things like that. Uh, we can't really touch upon. I don't deal too much in the negatives and tragedies. And there are other subjects that are a little, little delicate that I can't touch on too, but. But for instance, there is a uh, Dennis's mother is in a her usual state of shock and amusement, and uh, Dennis is um, standing here. his little fanny there and his pants down here and he's on a stool standing in front of the toilet and he's saying I don't have to wash my hands mom I didn't steer it this time <laughs> I'd love to do that one in the paper <laughs> and I might too <laughs> Just love to get the mail on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me see. I, I, just, just draw a picture of Dennis here properly if I can. See, I work on little drawings like this, so this is a little bit different. going to make an interesting tape recording. <laughs> well, he, uh, <laughs> and Dennis has a dog called Ruff, who was not really the Where's the Phi Beta Kappa key? He, um, but he's friendly. 
And when Dennis smiles, he's smiling. And when Dennis is sad, he's sad. And he kind of walks, he's like Joey, who was the only, the, the shortest kid in the block, the only kid. They, they all kind of uh, use Dennis as the barometer. And, because, um, and of course with Joey, uh, Dennis, uh, Joey lifts a little bit, you know, like Dennis. Gee, Dennis, I'm scared of that. Well, don't worry about that, kid. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, that's the way girls are. And uh, he becomes a, a quite a philosopher with Joey. So it gives us a chance to do a lot of interesting things. We had a television show that some of you may have seen that lasted four years starring Jay North as a live action uh, segment of the Dennis story. Uh, it was clean, sometimes funny, had good ratings. Uh, they're still stripping it, I guess, here in LA and around the country. Uh, but for my taste, it was not Dennis. Only the names were the same. I don't feel that with live action you can do uh, justice to a cartoon. It's like reading a good book and then having someone make a lousy picture of it. Or even a good picture, but it wasn't what you had in mind. So that there are many pitfalls in that. But it did get the name of Dennis around the country quite a bit, in addition to the newspapers. But I'm working now on developing an animated cartoon segment of Dennis, which I think will be a lot of fun. And I hope that you all get a chance to see it this fall. I'm working with uh, an old colleague of mine, Chuck Jones, at ABC, where we're doing, um, I guess you could call it, uh, Commercial TV's Answer to Sesame Street. Uh, so we're doing a children's programming will be aired between 11 and noon on Saturday morning, starting this September. And they want me to do two hours of it. Uh, so the dentist will be very much in evidence there. Uh, with some animated cartoons, and it should be a lot of fun. We'll do a lot of other things, too. They have me on camera with three kids and a chimpanzee. Now, if that chimp gets top billing, I'm going to go right over to another network. But uh, we're developing this thing now, and uh, we'll be taping it next month, uh, I believe. And uh, Dennis, we'll be, we be brought to the tube in a dimension that I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, I also do a cartoon that was released last February called Half Hitch. It's about the shortest sailor in the Navy. He lied about his height in order to get in. And um, the, um, he's got, we have the regular crew, the captain and the chief and his sidekick, Zwicky and Mooch. And we have a one uh, enduring little, instead of the parrot on the shoulder like the old pirates used to have, uh, he has Poopsy the seagull who talks, which, you know, uh, brightens things up a little bit. So I've got two comic features running loose around America, and I live in Switzerland, which doesn't make it any easier. But we have telephones there, and we have very good airplanes, and so that we communicate very well. I. Uh, would urge all of you to bring up your children to be cartoonists. It's better than working. <laughs> <laughs> it's a delightful privilege to be a cartoonist in that you can work anywhere in the world. You set up your own funny factory where you see fit and you invest about a dollar and a half in supplies and go to work. And it's not just a question of drawing a funny picture. There are many people that can draw funny pictures. It's a question of having a little, not only your own sense of humor, but a sense of the theater. Because when you draw uh, pictures of cartoons of people, you're putting them in various poses. And the poses have to be proper to the mood. The expression has to be uh, pertinent to, to the mood. So that you're actually, you actually become the actor for everything that you draw. Perhaps that's one reason why a lot of people uh, truly can draw funny pictures, but they can't put an idea across because they, don't, they haven't grasped the essentials of the theater. The, the staging, the lighting, and as I say, the dramatics. Even the dog, when you draw the dog, you have to know how the dog 
flops on the floor or sits up or, or raises a cock's one eye like that. And staging uh, a feature with a, with a child who is 36 inches high, working with uh, adults is another major problem. You either shoot the child in full figure and showing the legs of the adults, or you work the camera over the adult's shoulders to identify them and going down to the child that way. Uh, it's a little bit cumbersome, but these are the things that have to be solved in, in working on this particular kind of thing. I do and have done all of the daily drawings for Dennis since its inception. That, oh, 6,000 drawings and ideas, more or less, which is an awful lot to say about one little kid. Uh, unfortunately, we're not running out of ideas, so stay tuned. <laughs> These ideas don't come from my head entirely. I reached the bottom of the barrel 19 years ago. But I do have a crew of writers that are freelance writers, and they submit to me in written form, and I imagine the scene and do a little editing and send back what I don't like, keep the few that I like. I work with about four or five that, are, that make a living doing this, not only with me, but with others. And um, then I have a man in, in living in Connecticut who is a fine artist who draws my Sunday page, which appears in full color once a week. And uh, it's, it's working fine. The airplanes uh, move, move us from Switzerland to California with great rapidity. And once you're through the three-day jet lag, you're, you're right with it. And uh, this, by living here, by living in Europe and having a, a business in California, every trip is a business trip. You understand that, don't you, Mr. Income Tax Collector? <laughs> If we lived here in California, I'd probably, we'd probably go to Europe about once every three years. This way, we're here about four times a year, so we have the best of both worlds. We're enjoying it very much, and we're constantly amazed and impressed by what's going on here and in this vital institution here. You may not win all the basketball games, but you're a good bunch. I don't know how many art students or cartoonists, uh, would-be cartoonists are here, or drama students, or just curious people, but so I don't know really how to direct uh, our little chat, but if there are any questions that you have that you'd like to fire at me, I'd be happy to try to field them. Yes? On the uh, animated segments for uh, Chuck Jones and ABC, yes. are you doing the animation yourself? No, I won't be doing, anim I'll be doing as much as Walt Disney ever did. No, I've written the storyboards, and we have a good crew of animators who will be, uh, be laying it out and, uh, and doing the actual drawings. Animation, as you probably are well aware of, is a long, tedious, time-consuming, expensive thing. And uh, there are specialists here that I used to work with in the old days at the Mouse Factory who will be doing that. But my responsibility would be to the storyboards. And... Um, and to a certain direction, that is, what is the attitude, you know, and the timing and everything. But crew of specialists will be handling that animated segment, if I can afford it. Yes? When did you get into um, putting Dennis in the comic books? The um, comic book Dennis started about 15 years ago and uh, has done very well. Uh, I think I'm the first one in the business to send an artist-writer team on location for a comic book, <laughs> for a 10-cent comic book. I sent them to Hawaii because I thought, you know, you can't get it out of travel log. You don't want to run in all the old cliches about what you hear about it. Send these guys out there. Talk to the people. See it. Do it. Get involved yourself with it. Then report on it. And they did, and, it, and that was a fantastic success. There have been many, many reprints. They even reprinted it in Swedish, if you can believe that. But uh, then we recently did, done some on Mexico, and. Uh, the men recently came back from a trip in Paris and a, and a trip to London, so we're going to see in a comic book, uh, we feel that we're not hidebound too much by uh, rules of, uh, of 
behavior or motivation as we as I feel I am in the newspaper we can do anything with Dennis send him to Europe or you know but not in the comic strip he hasn't even been in an airplane and I'm I don't know I'm still fighting the airplane thing because uh, latest last count uh, uh, not any more than about 15 percent of the population has ever been up in an airplane now, I don't want to make Dennis the only kid in the block who's been in an airplane. I don't want to make him any different than any other kid. As soon as he becomes something special, then he loses his charm. Dennis is just a kid next door with hair in his eyes, dirt in his nose. And as soon as he becomes a superstar, or, oh boy, I want him in the aerial plane. Well then, wow, he becomes something special. So I, I may be a little conservative on that, but uh, maybe in the next few years we'll get him in an airplane. I was, I was wondering, uh, as your son grew up, uh, what was his reaction uh, to the cartoon strip? And what is, he's probably, what, how old is he now? About 30, 25? 30 years old? <laughs> he's only a kid. <laughs> 48. No, he's, uh, he's 24, Dennis. 24. 24. Well, so how does he feel now? Well, he'd just as soon I'd called him George. <laughs> No, he's, uh, he's gone through the mill on this thing since it started, people giving him kind of a bad time. He was in the Marine Corps and 13 months in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, they, they, they make a big deal out of it, but he, uh, I don't know, it's a problem. Uh, I finally pointed out, and he's aware now, that every child whose name is Dennis is one time in their lives called Dennis the Menace. They named, you know, Dennis Ralston, the tennis player some football players that the press will pick that up so that he's not alone, but uh, it, it wasn't a very easy thing for him. Uh, but when, as long as I spelled his name right in the checks, I guess it would be <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's doing fine now. Thank you. Yes? Is there any, uh, some sort of Nielsen rating for comic strips? Yeah, every, you know, each newspaper usually conducts its own poll. And uh, some of the polls are extremely private, others are printed, others you can get information from. And I'm more than happy that Dennis is always in the top three of all polls taken. And um, I don't know what this indicates, if people are getting the habit or, uh, they, you know, the front pages are usually pretty unhappy. If, they're seeking out Dennis for a little balance, well, fine, but Dennis is rated very high in the local polls. What are the other two? <laughs> well, they vary. Uh, you got this other feature about those orphans. Uh, you can call it walnuts or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, they, you know, depending. Uh, for instance, now, Pogo would probably, if they had a campus. Uh, a campus poll, Pogo would rate very high. Uh, however, on, an, on a city scene, Pogo rates, you know, very low, sometimes 10%. And some of the, you know, the editors, you know, were looking at the bottom line, throw him out, throw him out. Boy, they start throwing Pogo out. And all the devoted lovers start marching on the newspaper. If he has 10%, it's a hardcore 10%, then they won't let anybody throw that one out because it's an awfully done by a real talented, intellectual, musing guy. So it's hard to tell about polls. They haven't thrown, thrown Dennis out. Uh, I don't know what would happen. Uh, I'd just cry, I guess. <laughs> You're Dennis. <laughs> you know, I'd march on the papers. That's what I'd do. Yes? Yeah, are there any other uh, cartoons that you really admire? Oh, certainly. Oh, yeah. Why admire them? Well, I, uh, in the, not in the newspaper field, but I admire very much Eldon Dedini, who does a lot of work for Playboy and Esquire, New Yorker. He's a very talented fellow. Gus Ariola, who does Gordo, uh, I admire very much for his, his humor and design. Uh, I don't read many of the, much of this stuff. Um, I, li I like Peanuts for the fantasy, although I was, kid I was not kidding when I said it's about orphans. 
because it's not related to the family or to life. It's a symbolism, and but great fantasy. Uh, and I am proud of Sparky's success. Um, I like Rip Kirby, which is not really a comic. It's an illustrated story. It's a, it's a kind of a Sherlock Holmes format, but done extraordinarily well. I like Wizard of Id, that really turns me on. I think that's <laughs> funny. Johnny Hart's a great talent. Uh, yeah, I, there are some that I admire very much. I could give you a lot more, but I, I have to study it a little bit more. Yes? I was wondering, when you started working for Diz... Um, for Diz? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Walt. Well, when you started working for Oh, I didn't bring my portfolio in, but go ahead. Well, I did once uh, when I was working at Universal. I started at Universal Studios doing in-betweening and assistant animation. And I wanted to work at Disney, so I put my portfolio under my arm, went down to Vine Street where they had their big uh, personnel director. I didn't even see him. The, the secretary took it in. Sat there. And she came back and said, uh, Mr. Drake feels that... Uh, you should take up another profession that you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working in the business for a year and a half, and that did it. Made me, it just made me mad, you know. I thought, you know, this man is ridiculous. But she is. Always will be. Won't you, George? Oh. <laughs> but uh, I eventually got in because I say they need to finish up on uh, Pinocchio, and um, they needed extra people, so I was able to get in that way. But I first went to work at Universal. During a time that somewhat only worse, like we're going through now, a depression, where jobs were very, very tough. I, I leached on an uncle down here for two months, eating him out of house and home, all mashed potatoes and peanut butter I could gorge, waiting to get a job. And I finally got that job uh, for $12 a week down in Los Angeles. Uh, which is not bad. I live for six dollars a week down on Magnolia Boulevard, and three meals a day, and they lend me a bicycle to get to work. Then I got the big money when I got out to Universal, and they paid me sixteen dollars a week. I didn't know quite what to do with the extra money, so I bought a car. <laughs> Clever. I must have been a, a magician in those days. I can even park for a week for that. But. In order to get the job, I'd never been in animation, I never had a job in the art business before. And so I, the guy called, I called him up and he said, well, come up Monday and bring your samples. Samples, samples. I thought only Fuller Brushman had samples. <laughs> so I took the newspaper, the LA Times, and cut out some funny articles, you know, little strange things. Uh, and I illustrated them and put the article on my drawing and took them out. And it worked, you know, I fooled them. <laughs> and uh, and then I was there for the until the war. I was wondering, sort of, you know, like, as far as the Disney way of doing things mm -hmm. and, and the characters. I've seen some of the you know, instruction manuals, but I suppose that they hand out to you when you hire on. And it's like <coughs> Chip and Dale, like about Mickey Mouse. I'll well, sure so I was wondering if you had anything like that for Dennis and Dennis. That was for the instructional. Universe. You looking for a job? Oh. <laughs> Tell you, Dennis is not easy to draw, but you'd learn to draw him and I'll put you to work. Uh, no, I don't have anything. I have model sheets and things. And I usually work with my people and, and, and work and helping them get on. Disney had a school where we, we were students for a month uh, until we uh, got the hang of it. And then we'd start on you know, doing in-betweens, which is relatively simple. Or taking two drawings superimposed and with a light board on a clean sheet of paper, draw the lines in between the two drawings so that they flesh out the action. And then by doing that, you become acquainted with the characters. No, I don't have anything like that, but I'll put that on my agenda. <laughs> there is a Dennis Draw With Me pad that somebody, that I've designed for somebody that should be on the market, where I show them how to draw a dentist. I show kids how to draw with numbers, just draw numbers and make faces from the numbers, just little imaginative things. But I'll get the instruction on that. Yes? I was curious how you arranged your schedule. I always wondered, um, a lot of times I used to think that you send the cartoon to each 
Yes. Um, yes, I worry about my schedule too. I mean, when we're in the States, I don't do any work here at all. I don't have my setup isn't here. So I have to be eight weeks ahead when I get back to my studio. So that means before I leave, well, if I'm going to be gone six weeks, that means I have to be 14 weeks ahead of deadline. So what I do is to work in segments of two weeks and do two weeks of work and send it into New York to the uh, syndicate who then uh, redistributes it to all the all client papers. So I have to really uh, get well ahead. You know, most fellows work in two-week batches. Some work in a month, they'll send it in a month, but two weeks seems to be nice for me. And if I really paddle fast, I can, I can do four weeks in two weeks. See? So the mathematics works out, providing I don't get sick or want to play golf or, you know, get run over with a steamroller. Any, uh, any other question? Yes. Uh, over the 20 year period that you've been doing this, have there ever been times when you've kind of gotten sick of it and let it go or, you know, for a No, strangely enough, I've never gotten sick of Dennis. Um, and I guess this is why it's changed a great deal since the time I started. Because I'm improvising, I can see areas where I can tighten up and new challenges coming so that I look back on what I was done, what was done 15, 18 years ago, and I'm shocked because it's not the same. Well, every comic strip goes through this this change, but I'm particularly shocked. And if some young person came to me with some samples that were exactly like as I drew them 15, 20 years ago, I'd say, "Kid, you don't have a chance. Go back to art school. Learn to draw. Don't give me this stuff." It was terrible. I mean, when I look back at it now. But I fooled them again, you see. They didn't know. <sighs> yes? Uh, there are some comic strips that try to make like, social comedy. Right? You know, mm -hmm. Under the guise of humor. I don't mm -hmm. know how you feel about these. I think like Wee Pal, something like that, they're trying to, you know. Well, I think if it's, uh, if it's, uh, it's, you know, if they get their message across and it's amusing, I think that's fine. But I think the first criteria is it should, it should be amusing should be clever. If they want to tell a story, if there's a moral to it, well, that's fine. As long as people read it and enjoy it, that's, that's good. I, uh, the reader, the, you people here, are the ones that determine pretty much what you read in the newspapers. If you don't like it, tell them. I've been getting some pretty bad letters. Not many, but when I get them, I, I really notice them because they don't come often. One was... Uh, uh, several were in a retort to a Sunday page where Dennis was so frustrated at little Margaret he didn't know what to call her. You know, ran out of names and he finally said, you, 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 you girl. <laughs> oh boy, you should hear the letters that I got on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the racial issue I got some very bad letters. I, uh, I wanted to introduce it. I didn't want to do it like some people, just shade, shade the characters to show that they're blacks. I wanted to make them black. So I made one drawing, it was the introductory drawing of his friend Jackson. He's a very cute little guy. And Dennis is introducing him to his mother. He says, me and Jackson are exactly the same age, only he's different. He's left-handed. <laughs> Just cute. And I shaded it pretty well and made a cute little shaded um, kid. And Boy, we, got, we were up on posters and all kinds of applause. And then I, I went a little too far. The next time I had Jackson, I made him totally black. And I made him in a caricature that was, could it be a stereotype from, that from goes back to my colleagues that, pre that uh, were before me. And, uh, but in doing so, I incurred the wrath of many, many people, which I felt badly about, because it was certainly not my, never has it been my intention to uh, hurt anyone's feelings or castigate any race. And uh, the gag there was simply, uh, the gag was not, again, not the point, although some people commented. Dennis and Jackson are coming in the front yard talking to Dennis's father, who was mowing the lawn, and said, Dad, 
Me and Jackson have got a race problem. He runs faster than I do. Well, I, you know, it's a... I could have gone on and on and on, but using some kind of cute relationships, a little more subtle than that, but people uh, became art directors, which it amounted to, they just became art directors. They said, you don't draw blacks that way. You don't draw them all black. So, I'm not going to draw them. <laughs> and the people that were writing uh, were kind of uptight. And uh, I tested it on some, some pals of mine who liked it. And, uh, but the, the, the wrath that was incurred throughout the country, marching on newspaper offices, throwing rocks through St. Louis Post-Dispatch, chasing news kids and threatening editors with bodily harm and canceling their subscriptions, uh, it shocked me. I was on the phone a long time dictating telegrams to all the papers. I don't want to get involved in anything like that. It's too bad because I think I could, I could show a warm relationship and understanding between all groups. But I, in Half Hitch, I had the lo a Honolulu Star Bulletin editor uh, wrote in and said, we're, I'm sorry we're dropping Half Hitch because you've got a Chinese cook in there called Ding Chao, and we've got an ethnic problem over here, and I go, uh, they haven't even had one letter or phone call of, of protest or complaint. And this editor gets all nervous because I got a Chinese cook in there. Uh, some of the editors, I guess, maybe have gone through an awful lot of hell on, the, on this particular subject matter. But it, where do the guys who are supposed to be humorous, where do they finally uh, arrive at? Uh, what are we supposed to do? Uh, thank heavens Flip Wilson is doing something important, coming back into the picture and adding a little bit of a little oil in the waters. And people began to be human again, starting to laugh at one another and with each other. Uh, it's just, a, it's, a, it's getting tougher and tougher. Being a humorist is not a funny business, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said before, it's better than working. And, uh, <laughs> I've enjoyed talking to you here today, and I'm sorry there hasn't been more of you talking to me, but uh, that's the way it is with speakers, I guess. <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I, I have a question for you. Okay, shoot. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about Al Cap. Uh, I was wondering what you think of... Dirty uh, old man. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't deny that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the original we had, Dirty Old Man. <laughs> yeah. We had him speak here earlier, and uh, he uh, claimed to be a dirty old man. He was very proud of it. As a matter of fact, he noticed the girl's skirts were shorter, and he's he leaning over like this. <laughs> uh, but I was wondering, uh, he seems to be uh, sort of popular because he's controversial. Yes, and, he is. Uh, I was wondering if you saw his cartoon series, his strip on uh, Schultz, on Charles Schultz. I, uh, you mean where he featured uh, Schultz for a while? Yeah. Oh, Schultz wrote some pretty, s I know. pretty I fiery letters to, uh, to Cap, you know. He right. took umbrage to that. He didn't like that at all. Schultz was very nervous about people right. using his name and likeness. I think it would be a great, uh, great thrill. You mean, you Not mean, by Cap, of course. Walt really. <laughs> <laughs> well, Disney is. Well, uh, well, Cap, you can't deny his greatness as, as a, his contribution to American humor has been immense. Uh, I th personally uh, liked him better many years ago uh, when in the dog patch. Uh, I don't know, the economy was different then. Uh, now I, I rarely read him, but he's very inventive and very creative and very... Uh, provocative. Uh, he Al is a magnificent speaker too. I hope that most of you heard his his speech. He's a very amusing guy. I want to tell you just one little story about Al. During the war, uh, Al would go into the into various hospitals where the returning veterans were recovering and amputees, and Al would walk in there and chatter and and make some drawings for them, and just before his exit, 
he'd give him a little, little uh, good coach talk, a little pep talk, and tell him that they can make it too. That, and he raised, rolled up his leg and showed that he had a wooden leg too, and he's been getting along very well. But he didn't play that until just he made his exit. So, uh, well, he's he's my favorite one-legged cartoonist. <laughs> Yes, dude. Well, Ernie Bushmiller, who has been drawing Nancy since the year one, <laughs> it's a, it, it reads well, you know. It. Uh, are we talking about the same Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it's the same one that I've been looking at. Well, the ideas, again, as I said, come from a group of professional people who make their living supplying cartoonists with good material. I heard him on a TV show that he, he said he goes through uh, Sears' catalog and gets ideas like cuisine ironing boards and things and things and things. That's one way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I use the Sears Roebuck catalog, not for ideas. Actually, uh, I've been working with Sears for four years, illustrating the Sears Christmas catalog. I always wanted to il be a book illustrator, now I wound up illustrating the Sears Roebuck catalog. That's pretty interesting. But for years, I've used this catalog as a source material for scrap, because it's beautiful. You travel, it's all alphabetized. You just look under, you know, uh, ovens, uh, ironing boards, uh, clothing, it's all there, and it's, it's delightful. And, and uh, living abroad, of course, you, you know, I get to know what the new washing machines look like, and it's a, you know, a good deal. Well, you can, yes, you can look through a thing like a catalog and find some gimmick and, uh, that you can work a, a funny around. But normally, uh, Ernie, whom I know quite well, has been buying gags for years. The guy who sells it to him should be shot. <laughs> I haven't had the pleasure of reading it. It just keeps going on and on. Now, if you if you do really think it's a dumb thing, why do you? Read uh, it? It's because the editor has been used to it. Oh, he just you know he just forgets about it. If you say, "Come on, put in something better like half hitch." <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's the editor becomes apathetic about it. And then, of course, some older readers have been watching it, like uh, we were just talking a minute ago about uh, Gasoline Alley, how it's either folded or not appearing in the paper. Well, the, the creator died about five years ago, and that's about the length that these things last, is five years after the creator dies. And he made the mistake, I think, of letting the children, or letting the whole cast of characters grow up so Skizix, who was about my age, you know, then we started getting into second and third generations, I think it loses its effectiveness. But uh, you have to come right back to the editor who was responsible for this. Well, we're running a little late. Right, we have to go. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Ketchum. Thank you. Very much.